Over the course of Lent, the, the period of reflection before Good Friday and Easter, the church um, here has been focusing on journeying through the Psalms together. And we very intentionally have said if part of our goal is to prepare our hearts and to prepare ourselves for Good Friday, then what we need to do is figure out how to get ourselves into God's presence, how to listen to Him well, how to prepare our souls to be engaged by Him um, from our highest highs to our deepest lows. And the Psalms open up the world to us because they reflect um, the reality of the world to us. In the Psalms, you have the prayers that the church has prayed um, for thousands of years. Um, They're prayers of confusion and desperation. They're prayers of hope and worship. They're agonizing when God is silent. Um, They're despair when they feel betrayed. And what I love about the Psalms is that they lay those before us and invite us to pray all of those feelings, all of those emotions, our whole selves, before God because nothing has to be held back. And so part of what we've been trying to do during this Lent is to figure out how do we bring our whole selves to God so that nothing is held back. Um, And so the the Psalms are tremendous that way because every part of our life um, is exposed, is validated, and then is spoken before God. One of the other reasons we pray the Psalms, though, is because the Psalms were actually the prayers that Jesus himself prayed. Um, As a good Jewish man of the time, um, he would have prayed the Psalms frequently, multiple times a day they would have come to his lips. At every major religious festival, um, their acts of worship were to gather together as uh, clans and as people and as a nation before God at the temple, and they would pray the Psalms back to him. And so one of the reasons we pray the Psalms is we want to pray the prayers that Jesus prayed. Um, We want to pray the Psalms because they clearly influenced how Jesus understood who he was and what he was about because Jesus quoted from the Psalms more than any other book in Scripture. And so we want to pray those prayers so they become embedded in us. Um, And we want to pray those prayers of the Psalms because they so defined who Jesus is that they actually shape the narrative of his life so that the things that he does and the people that, the person that he becomes is shaped by the Psalms as well, because we want to be like Jesus. So we pray the Psalms together. So um, I'd like us to pray Psalm 118 together, because Psalm 118 is the text that influenced all of the Palm Sunday narratives that we normally read about in the Gospels. And Psalm 118 is an interesting psalm. It's a, um, it's a little incoherent if you're trying to figure out how is it organized until you realize this was a psalm that was prayed in public worship. And so um, the king or the anointed one would gather the people outside of Jerusalem and then they would begin the march toward Jerusalem before Passover and before the Feast of Tabernacles and other things. So as they're praying, Jerusalem is becoming bigger and bigger and they're moving toward it and then they get to the gates of the temple itself, and they ask for entry, and then they march up to the altar and offer their, themselves in worship to the Lord. So there would be a leader kind of singing or chanting part of it, and then he'd invite the congregation that's walking with him to participate as well. So that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to put the words of the psalm up on the screen, and wherever you see yellow text, I'd like you to speak the words of the congregation, and we'll journey together toward Jerusalem, uh, to the temple, then to the altar. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his love endures forever. Let Israel say, let the house of Aaron say, let those who fear the Lord say, when hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. All the nations surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They surrounded me on every side, but in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. They swarmed around me like bees, but they were consumed as quickly as burning thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them down. I was pushed back and about to fall, but the Lord helped me. 
The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. Oops, sorry. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. Choice and be glad. With bows and hands, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. It's this psalm which permeates Jesus' thinking as he begins to journey toward Jerusalem um, and to the temple on Palm Sunday. Now, think about the chaos. Think about um, the, the horrendous circumstances that Jesus is moving to on that last day. And then reflect on how your life may be a little similar at one level or another, right? Imagine the pressure Jesus is feeling as he's moving from having a huge following out in the countryside. He's moving toward Jerusalem to the final confrontation with the religious leaders who hate him. It's become increasingly clear, miracle after miracle, teaching after teaching, that they're angry at him. And after he raises Lazarus from the dead, they move overtly into a plan to try to kill him. And he knows this, and the disciples know this, because they've said just before, if we go to Jerusalem with you, one of us is going to die. They're plotting his death, and it's a death he knows is coming. And then think about if it's not just the external people, right? It's not just the enemies who are political or the religious leaders, but his own disciples still don't understand who he is. They're confused by him. So as soon as he begins to talk about, just recently before he heads to Jerusalem, I'm going to be rejected by all these people. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be crucified and I'm going to die. John, James, and their mother come to him, hey, could we get the best seats in the kingdom? And Jesus is, I'm sure, thinking, did I not just explain to you what the kingdom is going to be like? I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And they clearly don't understand who he is. Have you ever been in a situation like that where you just feel externally the world is chaos around me? People are out to get me. I have no help, and it only looks worse the closer and closer I get to the goal. Day by day, it's, I'm experiencing more and more pressure. And then you turn to the community around you, the people that you spent time with, that you invested in, that you trust to care for you, and you realize they don't understand you. They don't know you. You're more alone than you could ever imagine. This is Jesus' actual experience as he walks toward Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. <clears throat> Threatened by people outside, and preemptively abandoned, almost, by those who are closest to him. And if you've ever felt like you've been in that kind of a place, or you're feeling that now, then the invitation today is walk into the psalm with Jesus, because Psalm 118 saturates Jesus' self-understanding and identity um, at this point on Palm Sunday. He's been praying this psalm, Psalm 118, multiple times over the past 33 years, like any good Jew. On Passover, in particular, you would pray it as you and millions of your friends and family began the journey toward Jerusalem to participate in the Passover festival. Um, you'd pray it as the lamb was being sacrificed at the temple in preparation for you to take it for your uh, Passover meal. 
You'd pray it again after you'd finished your Passover dinner as part of the songs that you and your family would sing as you'd finished the dinner together. So Psalm 118 was in the air, and more importantly, it was in Jesus' heart and mind. How does Jesus enter Jerusalem so courageously? Because if it had been me, I would have thought, they want to kill me. I'm surrounded by ignorant people who I thought were my friends. I'm going in the opposite direction. Right? I'm going to go hide. I'm going to go find someplace else. What drives Jesus, gives him the courage and the capacity to actually walk to Jerusalem, not only without fear, but with a decisive command that he knows he's going to do this and he knows he has to do it. I want to suggest he's totally internalized this psalm, that it's so deeply embedded into his heart that it sustains him as he faces rejection by Israel's leaders and preemptive abandonment by his friends. Right? He's already then prayed that God has saved him from personal attack. When hard pressed, I cried out to the Lord, He brought me to a spacious place. The crowds might be um, surrounding him, the noose might be tightening around him as they come in for the kill. And what Jesus says is, Because I'm with the Lord, I'm not trapped. I'm in a broad and beautiful land where there's space and freedom. Nobody's driving to Jerusalem, I'm going there of my own free will. You may think I'm trapped, but I'm free because the Lord is with me. He's been praying through Psalm 118 that even though the world rejects him, he knows he has everything from the Father, right? All the nations surrounded me, but um, in the name of the Lord, I cut them down. You all, they rejected me, but I am secure. They buzzed around me like a swarm of bees where they're all around, flying around it. The the temptation is to run screaming, and he says, in the end, their threats disappeared, burned away as fast um, as thorns um, when you set them aflame. They were nothing. And then he prays through Psalm 118, I may be crushed, but I will not be killed. I will not die, but I will live. And I think what's happening for Jesus is the language and the poetry of Psalm 118 is so deeply set into his heart that even though all he can see ahead of him is doom, discouragement, right, and alienation, he walks in and says, I have nothing to be afraid of. The Lord's actually leading me to a spacious place. The people who would attack me will come to nothing. And though I may die, I will live. Because that's what happens, I think, when you are immersed in the Psalms, when you allow them to shape your mind and your heart. They actually equip you for the words that you need. Because in part, um, the Psalms were the prayer book of the people of God for centuries. And the reason is they define all of our existence in ways which give us life. For me, um, 10 years ago when I was planning to move here to New York City, I was facing um, both uh, my first kind of cross-country move. Um, I was facing the loss of my friendship networks, my family. I'd never lived more than 30 miles from my family, and I was going to move here to New York City. I was moving to um, lead a ministry that was um, in significant financial hardship and had been pretty discouraged for four or five years. It was in a crisis. And I remember being overwhelmed. And if you're like me, um, I uh, respond to stress by planning and by action. So I don't, um, the, the, the worse it gets, the more I want to plan. And my mind goes into overdrive, and I start to get busier and busier, because if just I work hard enough, I've taught myself, I can probably fix it, which is the pathway right to an early heart attack and despair. And um, I took a very short sabbatical before I came to New York, and the psalm that God led me to multiple times in multiple ways was Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I've calmed and quieted myself, and I'm like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. (sighs) Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. And I sat with that psalm every day for three months, and I continue 10 years later. This is the psalm I go back and reflect on on a regular basis. What I love about it, it's so short, I can't even work on it, right? Because my temptation with a psalm is to go, I'm going to study it. So a long psalm, I just want to kind of exegete it and think about it. And this psalm is, you know, barely five verses long, half of its repetition. 
And so there's nothing even mentally to work on. I just have to sit with it. And that's exactly what the psalm says, right? Hey, Greg, don't be concerned with things that are beyond your control. You aren't in control. You're like an infant facing this problem. But you're like a weaned infant resting at the breast of its mother, right? And a weaned infant is, a, infant is no longer breastfeeding, so the infant needs nothing from the mother other than to enjoy the mother's presence. Because the infant knows, I will be fed. I have been fed before. I know I'm secure here. I don't need anything, but this is um, the source of comfort for me. And the, ba- the, the toddler just snuggles there. And it seemed to me what the Lord was saying to me then and continues to say to me now is, Greg, stop frantically trying to control things. Let go of your need to fix everything and just rest with me. Not in a desperate, needy way like you're incredibly hungry, but as a child that has already received everything that it needs. Just enjoy my presence. Don't lift your eyes up to things that are too big for you. Just rest and trust in the Lord. And for over a decade, this has been the psalm that I've come back to month after month, year after year, because evidently I don't know how to learn the lessons that God has for me. Um, But part of what happens when you saturate yourself in a psalm, and for some of us it won't be a new psalm every day, it'll just be the same psalm over and over and over, is that it becomes the words of our prayer, it begins to shape the attitudes of our heart. Um, It gives us a way to voice what we need. As some of you know, um, my primary job is actually I work with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, a ministry on college and university campuses. And um, the Psalms became particularly important to us this past fall and winter um, during the great movements around Black Lives Matter, um, the Eric Ferguson uh, verdict here in New York City and what was happening in Ferguson in Missouri. Um, the black students that we were serving were in um, deep pain and agony as they kept watching people their own age dying. Um, unnecessarily. People who worked in law enforcement were struggling with how is it that the communities we most want to serve and protect are now angry at us? What are we doing? And all of our students, right, were feeling this pain and trying to figure out what as Christians should we do and how do we respond? And our first response as we prayed and thought about it as a movement nationally was let's bring them into the Psalms. Because in the Psalms, you find the songs of lament that we have to pray. It's not enough just to be angry, because a lot of people can be angry. But lament allows you to look at a world that's really broken and acknowledge it's broken and it's killing us inside that it's like this. And then you take that pain and that agony, and because it's lament rather than just frustration, you offer it back up to God in an act of trust that even though things have not changed now, they will indeed change because God is trustworthy, faithful, just, and true. And we thought the best thing that we could do immediately for our students is not encourage them just to march, though it was important to do something public to demonstrate their anger and frustration at what was going on. And it wasn't just that they'd be angry and vocal because a lot of people could speak, but to take actually their pain and their agony and their longing for justice and wholeness and to channel it through the words of the Psalms and offer them up to God because two-thirds of the Psalms are actually not Psalms of praise, they're actually songs of lament as the psalmist rages and cries and weeps over the brokenness of his own world and his own experience. What I love about the psalms is that they give us language to express to God the things that would otherwise be inexpressible because if you look at how Mary prays when she discovers that she is going to bear the Messiah, her Magnificat, she's just pulling language out of the psalms line after line and reworking them into a prayer that's appropriate for that moment. When Zechariah is stunned that his son is going to be John the baptizer, he pulls from the psalms line after line that have been stuck and um, seeping in his heart and then he offers up a new prayer to God. You can look at so many of Paul's prayers throughout the epistles, and what he's doing is he's just taking word after word, phrase after phrase out of the Psalms, wrestling with them, but then offering them up as an offering. When we allow the Psalms to saturate our lives, it equips us to encounter the world um, around us, the worlds that we need. <clears throat> so if you're a person whose prayers seem to go unanswered all the time, and you wonder, why is God so silent? Pray the Psalms because the psalmists have experienced that too. If you're a person who's in despair and discouraged right now, pray the Psalms because the Psalms explain and live that experience before God and many of them don't come to a happy ending at the end, tying everything neatly up but let everything lay messily before the Lord. 
If you're actually rejoicing right now and you're in a great place, virtually pray the Psalms because they give us language to describe God as he invites us to describe him, right? The whole of human experience gets laid out there. That's why for those of us committed to working emotionally healthy spiritual practices, the Psalms are critical. Because the Psalms, if you pray them from Psalm 1 to Psalm 151, allow us to pray our joys and pleasures and delight in God, and they force us to the deepest, darkest corners of our soul. And where you have to acknowledge our anger and our frustration, our rage and our bitterness, our lostness and our darkness, and you go, well, it's okay to admit this before God, but he put it in the Bible himself. He doesn't seem to be bothered by it. And so it carries us into a safe place. The Psalms shape us in that way. Psalm 118 doesn't just equip Jesus, right, to um, help him as he faces this kind of rejection, but it actually defines who he's going to be. Um, the psalm, as we described earlier, right, describes the arrival of a king, a righteous king, who journeys to Jerusalem, to the temple courts, at the gates, says, let me in. They say, only a righteous one can come in. And then the person, the king, says, look, I am the righteous one because God has named me and saved me. Let me in. And that's exactly what Jesus does. Um, Jesus arrives to Jerusalem as if he were a king, right? He ex accepts the acclamations of the people. They're so excited that he's here. They're taking off their coats and their cloaks and throwing it on the ground. It's like a giant red carpet from the Mount of Olives all the way to Jerusalem just for Jesus, right? Rather than um, a large uh, gate or anything, they're throwing palm branches into the air, creating kind of... Um, almost a, a tunnel for him to walk down, right? They, they focused all of the attention on him, and when they see him, they cry out in a loud voice, um, Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and Jesus receives it like, yes, I'm going to be the one who saves you, and yes, I am blessed because I am coming in the name of the Lord to redeem you. And he walks into Jerusalem. Well, actually, he's carried to Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, which is a little surprising. Because if you're coming as a king to Jerusalem, right, you're going to free people from the oppression that they're experiencing from the Romans. If you're going to upend the religious traditions that are so burdensome, you'd think he'd come on something more majestic, like a giant war horse, right? But that would have totally played into the, um, the myth about the Messiah that he was trying to reject because they all wanted a military ruler who would throw off the yoke of Roman oppression, who would redo the temple system in a way that would be better through power and through speed, and what Jesus does is instead he comes on the back of a donkey. It would be a little bit like riding in a triumphal parade on a scooter. Why does he do that? Because he's saying, look, your idea of what this king is like is all wrong. It's not overturning um, the political systems, though, that will come. It's not just overturning religious systems which oppress, though, that will come. It's going to come not through power, but through incredible weakness, through humility and through service and self-sacrifice. It's going to come as I lay everything down. And trust not in my own power, but in God's power, because I am righteous, because it is God who saves me. And I will be vindicated on that day. The psalm describes... Um, the experience of Jesus coming into Jerusalem as a king but then somebody who's going to be profoundly rejected. I've often wondered, um, how did Palm Sunday, which Jesus so widely acclaimed, so you know, welcomed by the crowd, turn to his rejection just a few day, days later? Right? How do you go from blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord to crucify him in the space of four or so days? I wonder that Jesus didn't have spiritual whiplash as he was watching that happen, right? Because it would have been easy if as he was going to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday to go, they like me, they really like me. Only to find later when given a chance, they were happy to kill him instead. I think Psalm 118 prepared him for that. Because Psalm 118 reminds him that um, he will be the cornerstone that the builders rejected but will actually be the foundation for the building, the kingdom, the temple that God intends to build. We know that this is actually in Jesus' mind because a day later when Jesus' authority to teach is questioned by the Pharisees and Sadducees, 
He tells them a parable, then he quotes the psalm right back at them. You know, the stone that the builders rejected will actually be the cornerstone around which God will build everything. And a cornerstone was critical in ancient building methods because you needed a cornerstone that had a perfect right angle because you'd build the entire building, um, both in this direction this direction, up uh, based on the angles of that cornerstone. So if the cornerstone were off by a little bit, if it leaned a little bit too far out, the walls eventually would t- topple over on themselves. And what Jesus says, is, you thought I was a damaged, misshapen cornerstone, but I was precisely the thing that God wanted to build his kingdom around. And I love how for Jesus, um, when he needed a snappy reply to the Pharisees and Sadducees, the words that came out of his mouth were the Psalms. You see, I don't know about you, but um, rude things happen to me, and I always want a snappy reply that will take the person down. Do you ever feel that way? Like you're on a subway, somebody does something rude, and you just wish, if I could just, mm, right? Or you're in an argument with somebody, and it's really fierce, and you're just like, oh, if I could just have that killer statement that would end this argument, and I always come up with it like a day later, <laughs> right? It's like totally at the wrong time. I'm like, oh, I should have said that. The problem, of course, is what comes to me a day later actually shows what's deeply in my own heart. And my statement that that I always come up with is usually mean-spirited. It usually involves demeaning the fact that they're made in the image of God. It usually is intended to crush them rather than love them. And so I'm frequently glad that I'm introverted enough that I can never think of anything clever to say in the moment (laughs) because I do far less damage and I reveal far less of what's actually my heart is like to the people I'm with than I would otherwise, though I seem to confess it during sermons. So, um, But what I love about Jesus is in the height of an argument with the Pharisees, the response that comes to his heart isn't a snappy one-liner that destroys their dignity or expresses the meanness of at heart. It's a snappy one-liner that comes straight out of the Psalms because the Psalms so deeply influence him, and it gives him words in every situation that are appropriate and from God. Right, that's one of the reasons we pray the Psalms together. Um, frequently in my ministry with college students, I meet with a student who just says, I am so caught in my own sin, I can't even think of the words to pray right now. How could I possibly approach God? And what I always say is, if you want to pray, then pray the words of the Psalms. Because in the words of the Psalms, you find your identity. Yeah, you're a sinner, but you're a sinner who'll be forgiven. Look with me at Psalm 51, and let's pray these words together. When I've, I've met with numerous students who are in the dark night of the soul, and they just think, I have not heard from God. I cannot feel God's presence. I feel abandoned by God. He won't answer my prayers. I have nothing left to say to him. I've run out of words in my own head. And I say, look, pray the Psalms with me then, because you'll find Psalm after Psalm, which begins, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And some of them only resolve, resolve with phrases as cheerful as, in darkness is my only friend. Let's pray these words together because they're God-given words for us at this moment. I I pray with my students um, who are stressed out, abandoned, rejected, and betrayed. And psalm after psalm gives them words to pray when they go, how do I express my pain to God when the people closest to me betrayed me so deeply? And for some of you, it may be a spouse, a friend, or a coworker who just stabbed you in the back at the worst possible way and you find in the psalms words that actually allow you to identify yourself as I've been wronged and wounded. So God, with these words, I turn to you for healing. We sit in the Psalms so that we have the words to say and become the people who can say them before the Lord, right? The Psalms give us that opportunity. We pray the Psalms together so we become more like Jesus who prayed these words himself and we experience transformation. So Jesus Um, facing a lot of external opposition and the potential abandonment of his friends, walks to Jerusalem fearlessly and boldly because he has nothing to be afraid of. Because he has the words of the Psalms to sustain him. He He knows who he is. He's the king who's coming to save these people, but he's going to be rejected by them and yet vindicated by God. And so he moves comfortably and courageously to his future without fear and without dread. And the words of the Psalms sustain him. The words of the Psalms give him language to use the words of the Psalms to define who he is. And so he comes to Jerusalem, encouraged by and defined by Psalm 118. And then as he hears the crowd using Psalm 118 to worship, he appropriates this language. 
And I suspect he smiles as he hears them pray, right? As he enters into Jerusalem, he encounters people who cry out, Hosanna, come save us. And I think what Jesus says is, I'm going to. And you have no way of imagining how I'm going to do it, but I will save you. And with every Hosanna, he thinks, that's why I'm here. I will save you. And as he enters Jerusalem, as he begins to move to the temple courts, and he hears people who cry out, blessed is he he who comes in the name of the Lord, and they're waving their palm branches in the air. He goes, yes, that's exactly who I am, though you don't see it yet. I am the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And it's right that you bless me and worship me and praise me. And all that you're expecting me to do, I'm going to do so much more than you could ever ask or imagine around this. You have no idea what you're saying. And yet you're saying everything that's right. And as he gets to the temple and he encounters people around the altar who essentially offer their allegiance and want to say, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. What he says is in just a few days, you're going to see how enduring and powerful and unalterable is the love of God. Because I myself will take your sins upon me like that lamb that you just sacrificed and I will bear it for you in your place and on your behalf so that you will never want ever again have to question the love of God. Because God has done everything necessary for your salvation. God has borne your own sin on his own self so that you could be free. And nothing will be able to separate you from my love. It's going to be far more than you ever could ask or imagine. And he wraps up all that they said unintentionally and unknowingly and offers it up, I think, as a prayer to God and says, Lord, take these words that they barely can understand and don't even know how to use and answer their deepest longings. When they cry out, save us, Lord, save them and use me to do it. When they cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as I arrive, may they see your glory, your truth, your holiness, your love, and your mercy. And then may they know that they can give thanks to the Lord because his love indeed will endure forever. When we enter our own experience of chaos, destruction, betrayal, silence, agony, or joy, the Psalms give us language like they gave Jesus language. They actually define us as people who can find a place before God. Sinners who are broken, people who are betrayed, people lost in the darkness, people who are rejoicing as worshipers. The Psalms say, you're all here before the Lord, so use this language then to speak to the Lord wherever you're at. Use this language to seep into your life deeply and thoroughly so that we become the kind of people that the Lord wants us to be, which is we become more like Jesus who allowed the Psalms to shape him. The invitation for all of us, right, is to saturate ourselves in the Psalms. Not just every Psalm, it may be like for me, the Lord brings you to one Psalm and you just sit there for days or weeks, months, or in my case now, a second decade until the lesson is learned. Um, but allow the prayers of God's people through the centuries to become your prayers as well. And if you want to experiment with it, then let me invite you, start with Psalm 22 this week. It's the psalm that actually defined Jesus' experience on Good Friday. It's the psalm that gave him language to pray when as he's hanging on the cross, feeling the weight of the world's sin, when he ran out of his own words, those were the words he turned to. Maybe between now and Friday, every day for five minutes of silence, as Pete suggested, we sit silently, we reflect on Psalm 22, and then we prepare ourselves that way to enter into Jesus' passion and from there to anticipate his resurrection. Let the Psalms give us words when we don't have words to describe what our Lord experienced. Let me pray for us. Lord, I'm grateful um, for all that I've filled this room with words that in the end you've given us your word and you've given us your language to describe who you are and who we are and who you desire us to become. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And we confess with all of Israel um, through time and space, you are our God, and we will praise you. You are our God, and we will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. Amen. And for some of you today, when you go home tonight, you realize... 
I'm stepping into chaos when I go home. Two hours from now, I'm walking into chaos. Maybe tomorrow morning when you go into the workplace, you realize I'm walking into chaos. In your neighborhood, something happening in your life where you're saying chaos awaits me. The same way awaited Jesus. But the truth about Psalm 118 is, although you step into chaos, God can sustain you. And God will sustain you. And Jesus, if you cut Jesus, Psalm 118 is what will spill out of him. And that's the kind of life that we want to have, that the Word of God so penetrates our hearts and so permeates our lives that if we step into chaos, this is what fills us. And this is why as part of our, our rule of life as a church family, we want Scripture to form you. We want you to be lovers of Scripture. And listen, if I can confess, there's so many times where I could be in Scripture and I realize I am just in something else, whether Facebook status or Twitter, I realize the issue is not whether I have time or not. The issue is have I really allowed God to permeate my heart through Scripture? And my prayer is that this week, that you would enter into Scripture this week. And maybe it's like Rex, that you're praying Psalm 118. Maybe it's you're praying Psalm 23, Psalm 22, whatever it is. But every single day that we would create a space, some silence, some solitude and some scripture. These are those three S's to read, some silence, some solitude, some scripture. To do what Jesus did. So that as you enter into your own chaos, God will sustain you. And the beautiful thing about Passover is this. Jesus says, I will save you. And some of you are wondering, will God rescue me? Will God intervene? The promise that Jesus gives you on Holy Week is, I will save you. But here's the caveat. Here's the thing. It might not look how you were expecting it. And so on Holy Week, really we're positioning our hearts to be open before God. Because when He rescues us, He rescues us in ways that we're not anticipating. When He saves us, He saves us in ways. As Isaiah 55 says, For your ways are not my ways, neither are your thoughts my thoughts, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And so we have our prayer team here. Maybe you're in a place, you're stepping into chaos. And you need to be sustained by God. This is why we end every gathering with prayer. To be reminded you're not alone in your struggle. You're not alone in your chaos. We would love to pray for you. And you will walk out of here assured that God is with you. And we have the Lord's table to my left as a reminder that Jesus is with you as you step into the chaos. And when you take bread and dip it in the cup, we are reminded, he says, I was broken for you. My blood was poured out for you. I am with you. I am for you. So you can come up the center aisle here, line up there, and receive the bread and the cup. So as we close, I want to invite you to open your hands uh, towards heaven. If you're new here, we do this every Sunday because this is a, a posture of receiving. A posture of receiving. And may you receive strength today. May you receive grace today. May you receive everything you need today as you enter into a chaotic world. A chaotic workplace, a chaotic home. As you step into there, just like Jesus was stepping towards Jerusalem, you know that God is with you, that God will sustain you, that God is for you. So with your hands and your hearts in a posture of receiving, brothers and sisters and sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he shine his face upon you. May he fill you with peace. May you walk out of this building in the power of the Holy Spirit, being reminded that God is with you, that God is for you. And may this week, may you make space to allow the words of Scripture to so permeate and penetrate your heart that as you step into a world of chaos, you are reminded that God will sustain you. So I bless you all in the strong, in the beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Grace and peace, everyone.